Hello there. My name is Mary Joan Doherty, and I am an ICANN Student Success Advisor in Eastern Iowa. Whether you are joining me live this afternoon or um, listening later, watching later on a recording, I want to thank you for taking your time to join me this afternoon to find out um, some information having to do with career and college planning. If you don't know much about ICANN, we are a small nonprofit organization in the state of Iowa. And everything that we do is to help us with our mission statement, which is to empower Iowans to find success in career, college, and life. And so all of the presentations we do, um, appointments we do, everything that we do is to help us with this mission. We have um, student success centers or offices all across the state of Iowa for the last 17 months or something like that. We've been mostly working virtually, um, but typically we have uh, office appointments in all of these different locations that you can see on this slide. And soon we will have more of our offices open for in-person appointments as well. So if you ever want our help or have questions or want to make an appointment for one of our services, you can call our 877 number and we would be glad to set you up with an appointment for one of our advisors to help you. These are the different advising services that we do offer, and all of these services are free. Um, the, probably our most popular appointment is our uh, appointment where we help people do the FAFSA, the application for federal student aid. But you can see we have a lot of other services having to do with college and career planning and understanding financial aid. If you did register for the webinar, you'll notice in your confirmation email that there were some um, links to some of our materials. And if you're watching on Facebook Live or you are watching this recording later, you can always have access to our materials, PDFs of our materials, by going to our website, icansucceed.org slash materials. And that will take you to our materials library where we have all sorts of great materials having to do with college planning, career planning, financial aid, just anything that has to do basically with that college planning process or career exploration types of things. But these particular materials on this slide that were attached to the email actually do relate to our topic of career and college planning for this webinar this afternoon. <clears throat> if you are watching on the live webinar and you have questions, you can use the chat feature and I will answer those as I see them. If you're listening live on Facebook, you can put questions in the comments. Um, I may not get to those till a little bit later, but you certainly can use that. And if you're listening to the recording later, you certainly can give us a call at 877-272-4692 uh, for answers to your questions. <clears throat> so we're here today again to talk about career and college planning. And so um, career planning, uh, which then can lead to college planning, really has to start with a student exploring careers. And one of the best ways for students to explore careers would be through doing what we call career assessments. Career assessments are short uh, surveys, short little uh, quizzes, assessments that actually ask students about different information about them. And then these questions lead to results that will give students ideas about what they might be interested in doing for a career. So these assessments can help students identify their strengths, their interests, and again, they're matched to different career pathways and different um, specific careers. And then these specific pathways and careers can give students all kinds of information about the career, salary expectations, economic outlook, kinds of um, qualifications they would need, what type of education and training they might need sometimes even personality qualities that would be helpful in that type of a job. And then all of these, um, this, these different careers and these different types of information can help students narrow down their options to help them know at least maybe a career pathway that they might be interested in. And then that can help them toward their training post high school. Career planning is an ongoing process. So it's always great to take those assessment results annually if possible. Um, it's, the, the career planning process will help students know what skills maybe they already have, but what skills they can keep working on, help them know what kinds of classes would help them in high school to prepare, to prepare for the actual education and training part of it and for the career itself, um, help them know how, how long they might need to take training, which can help with financial planning in that, that process of, of college 
preparation and not having goals, not having any idea of what a student might want to do post high school can increase the overall cost, which then often leads to high debt for students. So it's important to, to use those career assessment results based on, on the results that they get from, from the quizzes and then set the goals for their career and their post high school training from that information. In Iowa, we do uh, categorize our careers into six large career clusters. And then within those clusters, there are several different pathways. And then within those pathways, you find numerous specific careers. And the career cluster, of course, is the widest, broadest grouping of careers. The pathways narrow down some, and then, of course, the individual careers are narrowed more specifically. But even for students to have an idea of a career cluster they're interested in can be really helpful with post-secondary planning. And if they can even get narrowed down to a pathway or two, that could be really helpful in that, that process of trying to figure out what training they need and what, what kind of institution or training they will actually be able to pick for the training for that career pathway. So the different career clusters are listed on these next two slides. You can see that one of them is the agriculture, food and natural resources career cluster. The next one is the applied sciences, technology, engineering and math cluster. The third one is the business finance, marketing and management cluster. Then we have our health science cluster, our human services cluster, and the information systems cluster. And then again, within each of those clusters are several different pathways and within each pathway would be numerous various um, specific careers. So in taking that career assessment, we use a program called MyACT. Most of your schools probably have some kind of a career development um, program that they use, and those are wonderful too. And students often can have access to those outside of school hours because they typically have some kind of an account. But if you ever need an extra program to use, you can use the one we use, which is myact.org. Um, it is done by the regular ACT company that you may have heard of. But usually in any of the career exploration programs, you're going to have three different types of assessments that the students take. One of them has to do with the student interests. And so those interests that they indicate can be linked to career pathways. Another one would be their abilities or skills. And so usually those are pretty consistent between exploration programs and those can be linked to various career pathways. And then there are um, the values. A lot of times you'll find and and this is new for students sometimes, but you'll find an assessment about the values. And that would be things that would be important to the student in the job. And sometimes students don't think about that. They may be thinking about what they're interested in and what kind of skills they're going to need, but they don't think about what types of values they have that would relate to their job. And if you're an adult listening, you would know that that is really important. You need for your career to match the things that are important to you. Then those results from those assessments are put into some kind of a career map or a career chart, and that chart or map will help students find the different career pathways and clusters that match their results. And usually um, in this one, it's, it's a blue indicator. Those would be career areas that matched one of the test results. The red would be um, those career clusters that had multiple hits, so at least two of the different assessment results match those and possibly all three. So it's best for students to spend their time exploring the areas that did match what they indicated on their, their um, interest, values, and skills surveys. Again, if you wanna to go to my.ac.org, a student can set up their own account. They can go through those assessments and then find out all kinds of information about the different pathways that show up as matches to them. And if you would like help with that, if you would like us to help you through that process, we do advising sessions for career exploration through myact.org. So be sure and get a hold of us if you would like an appointment to do that with us. One area that we sometimes forget about when we're doing career exploration is understanding what the outlook would be, the job outlook would be for specific careers. So it's important to remember if a student's looking in a particular job field, will there be jobs available in that area when they're done with their training? It's very frustrating to get trained, to get a degree, whatever it takes to, to be ready for a certain job or career and then find out you can't find a job in that area. So it's important to explore that. It's important to see what kind of earnings they might expect, what kind of a starting salary, what kind of an average salary there might be. Um, starting salary should affect the amount of debt a student 
acquires in college because we don't want students to have more debt from their entire program for their career than what they might make in a starting salary. So it's important to look up that information as well. And you can research fastest growing careers in the United States. Um, you can see what job outlooks are, what potential salaries are in different parts of the country um, at various websites, the Occupation Outlook Handbook, that web, the website bls.gov is especially helpful. And then we have a specific Iowa website here too. In Iowa, sometimes we don't know that we have a lot of growing industry, a lot of growing career areas right here in our own state of Iowa. And you can see from this slide that in 2019, Iowa ranked number one in uh, a, a place to find a job in the US. So I think that's really awesome. And I didn't know that till I actually saw this slide, I'll be honest with you. Um, Iowa is known as the hub for ag tech and animal health research. That might be, not be so surprising because we we know that we have a great agriculture in our state. Um, Iowa ranks second nationally for wind energy installation, so that's a big growing field. Iowa is a leader in the finance and insurance industries. Um, you can see that in, in many of our bigger, bigger metropolitan areas of Iowa, and you can see that Iowa has three of the top 10 cities to work in technology based back in 2019. And then, of course, healthcare is one of the fastest growing segments of our, of our state. And I think you'd find that in many places around the country as well. Healthcare is big and there are all kinds of different types of careers that fit in that category of healthcare. Iowa is also big in manufacturing. 90% of Iowa's exports are from the advanced manufacturing sector. And there are all kinds of um, careers in advanced manufacturing that are growing types of career areas in Iowa. Um, you can see that um, these are some of the, the big areas in advanced manufacturing where there are a lot of the jobs available. Production, manufacturing, production, process development, maintenance, installation, repair, quality assurance, logistics and inventory, health, safety, and environmental, environmental assurance. So lots of manufacturing jobs out there in lots of different areas. And you know, manufacturing it has changed a lot over the years. Uh, I am not an expert in advanced manufacturing, but I know that there are a lot of specific skills that are necessary um, to have a job in manufacturing, especially advanced manufacturing these days. So lots of job possibilities there. Getting hands-on experience is another great way for students to do career exploration. Um, nothing beats hands-on experience. I think most of us would probably agree with that, but we do have an intermediary network here in Iowa, um, usually affiliated through our community colleges and then thus through the high schools that are uh, affiliated with those community colleges. If you wanna find out more about that, we have a direct link through our website to the Iowa Intermediary Network. But often students can do job shadows where they might spend a day or half a day or maybe a couple of days with a professional in an area of interest. That can be really helpful. Sometimes students will do a job shadow and find out they, they do really have an interest in that field. Other times a student might find out that um, maybe it wasn't exactly what they thought it would be. Maybe when they see that person in action in the day, they discover it's not quite what they expected that career to be. And that's helpful information as well. Then of course there are internships where a student, um, sometimes this doesn't happen a lot in high school, but if they get the chance that it would be great. Internships do happen a lot in college, but you know the student would actually work for a certain company or a certain organization and get a much more in-depth look at a specific career. And sometimes internships, especially in college, can directly relate to some great jobs after college. Then we don't always think about this, but volunteering can also be a great hands-on experience for career exploration. Students could specifically volunteer um, somewhere in an area that is a career interest or sometimes through volunteer experiences, I have seen students who actually found a new career interest just through regular volunteering. That um, was something I saw sometimes as a school counselor in my, my previous career. So volunteering opportunities are great for many reasons, but they can be part of that career exploration process. And there are a couple of websites here, volunteeriowa.org, volunteermatch.com that can help you find volunteer opportunities. And then, of course, clubs and activities are great ways for students to um, learn new interests and maybe get interested in some kind of a career due to those interests they find through clubs and activities. 
Of course, preparing academically is also import, important for a student's post-secondary experience. So one thing they can do is to always remember to review and update those four-year plans that they have throughout high school. Most schools do have students create a four-year high school plan their eighth grade year, and then they are revisited every year to make sure they're up to date, to make some changes, make sure the student's taking what they need for all purposes. It's important to work with the school counselor on this. It's also important for students to be, in, or excuse me, parents to be involved with the student's four-year plan. Um, you want to keep, of course, your high school graduation requirements in there, any classes that would help a student with career pathways that maybe they would like to explore, and then also knowing that um, they're getting in the proper classes to lead toward the proper admission requirements for some of the four-year colleges and universities. Taking core classes are important. Um, just as a review, your core classes would Core classes would be your language arts classes, math, science, social studies, history types of courses. Students who take challenging core classes are significantly more likely to be ready for college and career both. They provide a good solid foundation for any courses they will take in college and also for many of the career skills that students need. Um, they will be looked at by college admissions professionals at the four-year schools because at four-year colleges students have to be admitted and there are often actual graduation requirements in the core classes that students have to meet before they can even be considered for admission especially to say the state university types of schools. Also core classes are shown to provide valued workforce skills for students too and we don't always think about that we just think about core classes preparing students for college but core classes also provide valued workforce skills to students for the actual careers. And then um, if, a, if a student gets the chance to, any college credit type opportunities are very helpful. And also besides those core classes, I like to mention that electives are also very important because electives can serve as a way for students to actually explore different areas that again might lead them to career interests. If students are looking at some kind of uh, uh, career tech kind of, of pathway, then any kinds of courses they can take at school that would help them with that pathway would be very helpful, very recommended. Um, if your school happens to have some kind of a career academy, that's a great way for students to get some hands-on experience and some knowledge about some different CTE types of programs. Beyond the high school graduation requirements, which of course students must meet to, to get that high school diploma, there's also what we would call optimum preparation. And some of these, um, these actual requirements for optimum preparation for college and career will be more than what your high school actually requires. Typically in Iowa, high schools do require four years of English language arts, but students do wanna make sure that they're taking the actual courses that will prepare them for whatever their post-secondary plans are. Most schools in Iowa don't require four years of math to graduate, but optimally, it would be great to have four years of math. Um, I would really encourage, if you're a parent listening, I would, I would encourage you to have your student take that fourth year of math, or if you're a student listening, I would encourage the student to take that fourth year of math, even if it's not required. <clears throat> Studies show that math is one of those areas that, that seems to, that fourth year of math seems to really have a strong tie to student success in college that first year. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but whatever that fourth level is for your student, I would really recommend you have them take that fourth year. Um, also, if they're going to be taking some kind of an admissions exam, like the ACT or the SAT, if the student is not taking math when they take that test, they find they don't do very well on it because they've forgotten what they've done. Math is one of those things where we're not using it, we tend to forget a lot of our math skills. So I would really encourage you to take that fourth year of math. Um, if you're thinking about any kind of an engineering field or health, healthcare, um, health sciences, anything like that, um, anything where you're gonna have to take science, definitely consider that fourth year of science as well. And then of course, three or four years of social studies history. Um, we'll talk about foreign language in a, in a minute, but um, that is an optimal type of preparation course as well, the foreign language, world language area. And then of course your electives, because again, electives are a great way to explore and a great to get some ideas of skills for certain career pathways. And then again, know what the college admission requirements are for any of the, especially four-year 
institutions your student might be looking at because some of them will have specific core classes that students have to take just as part of the admission requirement. <clears throat> It's important for students to always do their best. They want to get the best grades that they can in the courses they take, but they also need to challenge themselves. Getting really good grades in easy classes isn't going to do much except give you a good GPA. And in the end, that's not going to be what matters. It's going to matter what they learned. So it's important for students to do their best and stay challenged. Um, admissions offices, again, will be checking that transcript and seeing what, what core courses the student took and how well they did. Of course, um, those, those quality course, courses and getting good grades will help them with scholarships when they go to apply for scholarships to help pay for college. And it's important to remember that all four years of high school matter when it goes, when it comes to that cumulative GPA that it's on that high school transcript forever. That cumulative GPA is on that transcript for the rest of that student's life. And we've got three different examples here of three different types of students. And um, the first one you can see is a student who, you know, did pretty average their freshman, sophomore year, 2.5 GPA. Junior year did better, probably worked a little harder. Senior year worked harder yet, ended up with a 3.5. And you can see their cumulative GPA still didn't quite get to that 3.0, which is a B average. And that's because those first two years mattered and that average try at their courses did not allow them to raise that GPA up quite enough to get it to that 3.0, but it is good. College admissions people would appreciate seeing that that junior and senior year, the student did work harder and did raise that GPA. They do appreciate seeing that. The second student's kind of the opposite. Um, you can see they started off with a B average freshman, sophomore year, so they probably were working pretty hard. Junior year did even better, raised that GPA to a 3.25 that year, but then they kind of slacked off their senior year. And so that affected their CUM GPA, even though they had three years at 3.0 and above, that senior year brought that CUM GPA under that B average. And that does happen. I was a teacher and counselor for 34 years. And I know that I did witness students who had been very good students for some reason that senior year just didn't care very much anymore or didn't think it mattered. I'm not sure which sometimes, but all four years matter because that senior GPA can bring that CUM GPA down and admissions office people don't like to see that because that suggests that the senior really didn't work hard that senior year and sometimes those bad habits will carry into college. Third student worked hard all four years, ended up with a great GPA there. And so the admissions people would be very pleased with that as long as they were taking the right courses along the way as they were earning those grades. Another part of the college admissions process would be um, entrance exams. So traditionally four-year colleges and universities did require some kind of an entrance exam like the ACT or the SAT. In Iowa, most of the students take the ACT. Um, this has been a little bit different during the pandemic. Testing has not been as widely available. And so um, different colleges are doing different things about the entrance exam, but um, you can check with that as you're visiting colleges and, and see where they are with the entrance exam piece. Sometimes even if they're not requiring the ACT or SAT for admission, they're still, they still often have some scholarships that are tied to those scores. So definitely do your research there. But if the student's going to be taking the ACT or SAT for, for your college admission or for some scholarship purposes, they need to um, work hard to prepare, maybe do some practice testing for that, retake it more times if necessary to get a better score. Um, because again, especially with scholarships, sometimes those, those higher scores can mean more dollars and often they're more dollars for scholarships that are renewable, possibly for all four years at the college. So check with admissions offices to see what their policies are and what their requirements are. Check with school counselors about available dates for these types of things. Um, community colleges, typically you don't have to take an entrance exam, but often students will take some kind of a placement test like an AccuPlacer or, or a Compass or an Asset test, something like that. And that's just to see if the student is ready for college level courses in those core areas that might go along with the community college program. World language is another um, area that especially the state universities might require as part of their, their actual admission requirements. And typically high schools in Iowa do not require world language for graduation. So students need to be looking at whatever colleges they're considering attending. And if there's some kind of a world language requirement, then students need to make sure and get the right courses in. In Iowa, our three regents universities have 
different requirements when it comes to world language. Whoops. And so you can see at Iowa State, it depends on what they're going into. If they're going into one of the many, many majors of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Iowa State or the College of Engineering at Iowa State, they do need two years of foreign language just to be admitted to those colleges. So again, trying to do your research and finding out what's necessary within the colleges is important. And I believe, unless it's changed, it used to be that to graduate from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Iowa State, a student actually had to have three years of foreign language. So again, find out what, what um, requirement might be for world language for admissions and also make sure to see if there's some other requirement for actually graduating from a specific college within the university. At the University of Iowa, there is a requirement of two years of the same world language to be admitted, but many of the programs at University of Iowa require four years of the same world language to actually earn the degree in that, that program. So many students, pretty much most of the students, if not all the students I worked with, if they were considering University of Iowa, they stuck with that world language for four years of high school so that that was taken care of before they even got on campus. You and I, um, they actually do not have a world language requirement for admission, but if the student has not had two years of the same world language in high school, then they will have to take the equivalent of two years of foreign language while they're at UNI. So to be safe, two years of world language in high school is probably best if the student's looking at UNI as well. One other aspect of the admissions process in Iowa would be again for those same three regents schools, Iowa State, University of Iowa, and UNI, there's an actual index or number called the RAI, which stands for Regents Admissions Index. And that is another component of the admissions process for those three schools. Typically, it has looked at the highest ACT or SAT composite score that the student has had that goes into the formula. The high school CUME GPA goes in the formula and then the number of core subject area courses completed in high school goes into that formula. And again, that's your English, math, science, social studies, and your world language goes into that as well. And then those numbers go into the formula. And if the student has a 245 or greater, then that part of the admissions process is automatically met. If um, it's less than that, then they may do an automatic review or they may give the student some other options, uh, or sorry, an individual review, or they might give the student some other options. So the REI is part of the admissions process at the Iowa Regents Universities. Another part of planning for college, of course, would be um, outside of academics and, and career exploration, and that would be being involved and getting lots of great experience. Students uh, being involved in clubs, sports, music, all kinds of extracurricular activities at high school, that's important. Um, scholarships ask about those types of things. The experiences that they gain in those types of activities, um, just working with others, leadership, um, just all kinds of experiences go into that. Volunteering, of course, is helpful. Volunteering activities, community service activities, nearly always asked about on scholarship applications. And again, those are great ways to meet people, to get involved, to learn some new skills, maybe even find a new career interest. And then part-time employment. Um, when I was a school counselor, I distinctly remember sitting in on a scholarship committee meeting and some of the people on the committee meeting were a little perplexed because as the, some really great students submitted some really fantastic scholarship applications, they noticed that the students had never ever throughout high school had any kind of a part-time job. And that really bothered those people because they felt like it was a really important part of planning for college and you know, trying to earn someone's, some of their own money for college as well. So it didn't sit real well with them. So lots of good reasons to have a part-time job at some point in high school getting to work for a boss, um, learning to work with other people, maybe learning to work with the public. So important for students to get involved. Um, they'll learn time management along with that busy schedule that they will have. Again, they'll learn to work with others, learn leadership skills and scholarships, ask about all of those types of things as well, typically. The world has changed a lot. Back in 1973, only 28% of the jobs out there required some kind of training after high school. So back then, it was very easy to get a really good job right out of high school and do very well, be successful, have a, a good quality of life. But times have changed. And at least 68% of the jobs in Iowa now require some type of training or education after high school. And the thing is, the other 30, 32% of the jobs um, probably don't pay well, probably aren't going to have a lot of great benefits. 
maybe not much of a chance for advancement in those jobs. So students nowadays need to consider some kind of training post high school to get that job that's gonna help them live the life they want to live. Is education and training worth it? Um, you can see from this chart that typically the more education or training a person gets, the better they're going to get paid and usually better benefits along with that. Um, not always completely true. I've seen students who had associate's degrees that made more money sometimes or apprenticeships even um, that maybe ended up making more money having better benefits than some people who had uh, bachelor's degrees sometimes. So it can, it can vary a little bit, but some kind of training or um, education after high school is definitely going to help the student earn more money and have probably better benefits and probably more job satisfaction. So many great education and training options out there these days. Um, we're going to talk about the apprenticeship career training program on the next slide. There are a lot of short term programs at the community colleges, certificates, diplomas, usually a year or less of training for those associates degrees, which are two year degrees great programs involved in these short training um, options. And with a short training option, the student is probably not going to have to borrow much money at all, sometimes no money at all, depending on the situation. So they end up getting a, a decent paying job and not having a lot of debt to pay off. So it's worth looking into these short term programs. Some students are starting at the community college with the idea of getting this Associates of Arts or Science to then transfer into a four year school. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, another other training options, of course, would be your traditional bachelor's degree, four years typically. And then, of course, some careers are going to ask for a master's degree or even a doctorate degree. And then, of course, you've got military or specialized training options out there as well. So any one of these training options is really going to benefit a student in their possible career options and hopefully, again, finding a career job that is very satisfying to them. So again, some kind of post high school training is essential, but that four year degree is not. And I do, I'm pretty old. So I do remember a time when everybody thought that you had to get a four year degree to be successful. And that's not true. Not everybody needs a four year degree. Not everybody wants a four year degree. Not every job even asks for a four year degree. So know there are lots of options out there. Trade jobs account for over half the labor market and over half the job openings in Iowa. So lots of great trade jobs out there. 40% um, of job growth in 2017 included 2.5 million jobs in areas such as advanced manufacturing, healthcare, building and construction trades. So again, lots of options there with possibly some short-term programs to, to train for those jobs. And then there are tons of manufacturing jobs out there needing Field, field as well. And again, those manufacturing jobs need specific skills that you don't have until you, you've done some kind of training option. So a great program in the state of Iowa is a, an apprenticeship program, a construction trade apprenticeship program. And what this is, is it, con it combines job training with some structured learning. The students don't have to pay for the training. They actually get paid for their training, but they will have some classroom experience as well as lots of hands-on experience with a professional tradesman in whatever trade area they choose. And when they're done with that program, they have the skills they need, they have the knowledge they need, and often they are offered employment when they're done with the program. Now, it's not like a student can just decide they're gonna do that and it's gonna magically happen. They have to apply and be accepted to these programs, but it is a great option for someone who realizes they wanna be in a trade, but they don't necessarily wanna to have to go to the community college and um, pay for that training. So the trade options in that program currently are listed here and they're also in our college career planning booklet guide that's in our materials online and was also attached to the email that you received if you did the webinar. But every single one of these trades has some kind of an apprenticeship on the job training um, program here in Iowa. So uh, lots of information out there if you want to check that out. If the student has decided they're going to go on to some kind of college for their training for the whatever career they're looking at, then hopefully they will remember to use that information they gained from the career assessments, the career exploration, and only choose colleges to look at that have those programs. As a counselor, I sometimes had students that had their heart set on a particular college, whether it was maybe the family all went there or they just were a fan of their sports or something, but they always wanted to go to a certain college, but that college didn't offer the program they wanted. And so sometimes they went ahead and went to that college anyway, and that caused a problem because it didn't have the program and then they're kind of wasting their money. So 
only try to look at colleges that have the programs the students interested in, um, explore what their job placement rates are, consider what the cost of the college is versus what that student's going to make when they graduate from the program and go into that field. Again, we're going to talk about this again too, but it's important students try not to borrow more money for their program, their educational program, than what they would make that first year on the job. So lots of different things to consider. And then there are the different types of colleges. So many students can go to community college um, for their program or to start their program and then transfer. For a community college, admissions pretty much open to everyone. They need to have some kind of a high school diploma or high school equivalency. Um, it isn't that there's a whole admissions process to get actually accepted into the community college. They can be accepted in. But sometimes within a program at the community college, a student might need a specific level of skill in a specific core area. So maybe they have to take a certain level, be ready for a certain level of math for whatever community college program they're taking or a certain type of English or communications course or science course, something like that. And so typically at a community college, even though you can be admitted with that high school equivalency, um, then once they decide what program they're going into, they may have to take some kind of a placement test to make sure they're prepared at whatever level they need for the different core classes involved in that program. And if for some reason the student doesn't score well enough on that placement test, then they might have to take some basic courses there at the community college in that area before they can get into the actual college level course that they need. The four-year colleges and universities actually do uh, want to make sure that the student is prepared to be successful at that four-year institution. And so they have different ways they look at the student to try to make a determination about whether or not that student is at the specific academic level to be able to be successful and complete the degree there. It's just their ethical responsibility to go through that admissions process with each student. And typically they've always looked at the high school cumulative GPA. They've looked at the core courses the student has taken from that transcript that they received from the high school. They've traditionally looked at the highest admissions test score, such as ACT or SAT. Some schools are looking a little bit more holistically along with that and do look at the students' activities and leadership responsibilities. But overall, when they get done with that process, they accept the students that they think have the necessary academic skills and maturity um, that, that, this, that will show the student is really prepared to achieve that degree at the four-year school. So there is a process to that at the four-year colleges and universities. As I mentioned a minute ago, um, many, to, many students are actually starting at the community college, often to save a little money and trying to take courses that then will transfer to the four-year school if they want that or need that bachelor's degree. Many two-year and four-year schools have transfer agreements. Here in the state of Iowa, there are a lot of transfer agreements in place, but regardless, um, if the student's wanting to transfer, it's really important to plan ahead and you need to talk to a transfer advisor at the community college you're attending, as well as the transfer advisor at the four-year college you're planning to attend after that. And just make sure that the things that the student's taking at the community college will transfer into the, the four-year school. Um, this has improved uh, tremendously over the years here in Iowa. It used to be kind of a nightmare sometimes when students wanted to transfer, but the Iowa schools have done a wonderful job of, of uh, working together to make this a better process, but you do need to plan ahead and talk to the advisors at both schools. Also, there are a couple of websites that can be helpful. IowaPrivateColleges.org has specific information for a student that wants to transfer into an Iowa private college, and then TransferInIowa.org has specific information for students that want to transfer into one of those region schools, Iowa, Iowa State, UNI. Again, lots of things to consider when a student's looking at colleges. Again, make sure you're looking at colleges that has that colleges that have the program that the student wants. Um, it's important to look at cost and find out what they have a, with financial aid, but realize that there is financial aid available. So sometimes the cost shouldn't necessarily be a complete deterrent because sometimes financial aid can make an expensive looking college come out to be about the same as a state school. So just keep in mind those kinds of things and have backup plans if you are looking at some expensive schools. Size is important to remember for some students, especially because um, some students can thrive and be very successful on a large college campus. Other students need something a little bit smaller where they're gonna have a little bit more individual attention. So it's important for students to maybe visit both types of campuses and see where they feel best. 
but um, it's, a, it's a definitely an important consideration. Locations of the college can be extra important. I think some students are, are ready when they graduate from high school to go clear across the state or, or clear into another state. And they're okay with knowing they may just be home and see family on a, on a big break a big vacation break from college. Other students, whether or not they wanna go home all the time, might wanna be close enough that they could if they needed to. In my own family of three sons, um, one of them uh, easily went from Western Iowa clear over to Eastern Iowa school and hardly ever came home and he thrived there. But the other two, they didn't necessarily need to come home all the time, but they wanted to be somewhere where they could if they needed to, or if they just wanted to come home and touch base and be relaxed, they just wanted to be able to get there. So location can really matter. Class size kind of goes along with size of college. Again, some students are, are fine in a large lecture hall with hundreds of students. Other students um, would feel lost there and they would rather be someplace where, where the class sizes are small enough that the instructors are definitely gonna know their names and maybe recognize them if they see them around campus. So something to consider. Safety, I think colleges have done a great job of trying to um, implement lots of safety measures these days. But if you're interested in that, be sure and ask how they keep the students safe. And then extracurricular activities. Besides the program the student wants, if the student wants to be involved in a sport or music or drama or um, dance or mock trial or whatever it happens to be, try to find a school that has the right academic program, but also has the extracurricular activities that students would like to be involved in. There's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to find that because often those extracurricular activities help students meet people. They help them gain all other types of valuable skills and um, sometimes it's the last time you get to try something like that, some of those sports and music types of activities and dance and such. So lots of things to consider. So then of course, making campus visits is huge when it comes to that college exploration process. And our last couple of graduating classes have had a little more trouble with that because of the pandemic. Um, college campuses were shut for a while. And then once they opened, all, you, all students could do would do virtual visits. I think that campuses are opening back up. Um, they might still offer some virtual visits if that's helpful, but hopefully you can get to some in-person visits as well because being on campus is important. Um, students usually get a feel for a campus when they're on, on the campus. You can listen to people talk about it. You can watch videos. You can read about campuses. You can talk to people who go there, but you can't get a feel unless you're there in person. And that feel is very important. I, in my own family, I know students got on a campus, thought they would love it. And for some reason, it just didn't feel like the right fit. So they took it off their list. But I know other students who, you know, not 100% sure. And then they got on a campus and wow, they just knew that that was a place they would feel really good. Um, so that in-campus visit's very important if you can make that happen at all. But when you do a campus visit, you need to make an appointment through the admissions office. You'll probably get a campus tour. You can ask to sit in on a class. You can ask to meet with faculty in a program area. You can ask to meet with a coach or a, a sponsor of a certain activity the student's interested in. Important to maybe talk to the financial aid office, find out what kind of scholarships and financial aid are available. Um, if you take a second visit, or even if it's just a first visit, you might be able to do an overnight stay and just see what campus is like, um, just kind of being with some other college students. Um, just keep track of how you feel on campus, keep track of the things you liked, the things you didn't like. If a student visits, visits a campus and they don't like it, it's not wasted time. Take it off the list and then your list gets narrower. And sometimes as the list gets narrower, it is nice to take a second visit if possible as well, because you feel a little more at ease and might know a few more things to ask. Usually campus visits, um, junior year are big, but if you can make some campus visits, maybe second semester of sophomore year, that's helpful, but definitely visit during junior year um, and then maybe wait if you have to take some second visits early in the senior year, that works as well, but there's a lot of things to do that senior year. So it's important to get those done, um, maybe late sophomore year, junior year, especially. Another way to explore colleges would be through what we call college fairs. Those again had turned have turned virtual for the last almost year and a half now, but hopefully we're going to have some in person types of college fairs coming up in this next school year. We're going to kick things off with our Golden Circle College and Career Fair at Prairie Meadows Conf Conference Center in Altoona, Iowa, near Des Moines on Sunday, September 26th. This is, has always been the biggest college fair in the state of Iowa. We get people from all over the state. 
We get college reps from not just Iowa and the Midwest, but from other locations across the country. We have breakout sessions. We have career people there. We have people that can talk, you can talk to about apprenticeship programs, um, just tons of people and organizations and college reps at this fair. So mark your calendars for Sunday, September 26th, and we're planning it in person again at Prairie Meadows Conference Center that afternoon. Then people often wonder, well, when is the student supposed to apply for college? Well, usually that's not going to be until the fall of their senior year, or maybe occasionally the summer before senior year. So sophomore year students should just be focusing on their classes and their grades and their activities. And maybe they'll get a chance to take a, a pre-ACT or the pre-SAT test if they talk to their counselor, um, attend college fairs, see whatever they can do to prep junior year, keep working on classes and grades and um, uh, classes and grades and being involved, start to pick out schools to visit. Um, if they did any visits their sophomore year, then maybe they can visit more their junior year or do some second visits. Uh, again, talk to college reps, talk, go to college fairs. There might be some schools you might find out suggest that you do an early admissions application. And if so, they'll probably ask you to do that maybe during the summer. Or if it's some program that fills up fast, they might tell you to apply your junior year just because the waiting list is long. And then senior year, you will definitely be finish up, finishing up those applications that fall. Um, apply to as many schools as you want, but definitely if you're applying to some expensive schools, have some backup schools, some highly selective schools, have some backup schools, schools you know you could get into, schools you know you could pay for if you had to. And just keep track of lots of lots of deadlines because you're going to be applying for financial aid, um, you're going to be applying to schools, you're going to be applying for scholarships, you're going to have to be meeting deadlines for all of those things, as well as sometimes housing deadlines and different types of things. So um, definitely finish high school strong and stay focused to get all of this accomplished. When applying for college, if you had all of these things ready, you would be ready to go. Not all college applications are going to ask for all of these things. Typically, um, you definitely will have to apply, usually online. Um, Eventually, some of them are going to want a high school transcript to start with. Some are just going to ask for official an official high school transcript uh, when the student graduates. Four-year schools traditionally have always asked for, again, those admissions test scores like the ACT or SAT. Um, some might ask for some kind of an admissions essay. Some may ask for letters of recommendation. Um, some may have fees. Some may have interviews. But if you just have all this, this information ready to go, then you should have everything you need. But Different schools may require some different things. Some admissions applications are very simple and basic. Others are going to take a little more time and be a little more involved. Then of course, there's always the question, how am I gonna pay for college? I wanna to go to college, I wanna get a certain type of degree, but how am I gonna pay for it? Colleges have two different types of costs. They have what we call direct costs. That would be your tuition and fees. So tuition for the classes and the fees that go along with them. And then they have room and board. If the student's going to stay on campus and or eat on campus, that's a cost. Those direct costs are pretty much set for you. Um, you don't really get to bargain on those. You know, it's just set for you. Now, you may be able to change a little bit on room and board, say, by there are colleges where certain dorms cost more and certain dorms cost less. Most schools, if they are going to be eating on campus, have different board plans for different numbers of meals per week. So you might pay more for your, your meals or you might pay less. But for the most part, those are set for you. Then there are indirect costs. These are things that hopefully you don't have to borrow money for. Um, if you're a budgeter, the college might give you some indication of an estimate of what these indirect costs might be for you, but you have control over these. You can spend extra money on these things, or you can try to spend less money on these things, but that'd be your books and supplies, transportation costs, miscellaneous and personal expenses. So you can try to get used books, rent books, um, find the cheapest book possible online instead of going and buying the brand new one at the bookstore. Transportation. If you don't take a car to college, you won't have much cost for transportation. Or if you take it, but you don't use it very much, your transportation costs will be less, of course. Maybe carpool with somebody if you can. And then, of course, the miscellaneous personal expenses definitely are um, under the control of the student and the family where you're going to spend on those. So direct costs set for you. You won't you have to pay whatever they bill you. Indirect costs you do have control over. And hopefully you don't have to borrow for indirect costs. 
Then you can apply for financial aid to help you pay for college. You do that by filling out an online form called the FAFSA. FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Um, there's a new FAFSA for every school year and the new FAFSA for the next school year always opens up on October 1st of the year before. So if anybody's listening from the class of 22, though it'll be the class of seniors this coming school year, your first FAFSA will open up this coming October 1st. It will ask for a lot of different uh, types of information, just mostly demographic and financial from the parents and the student. It'll ask for specific information off of a specific year of federal tax forms and that same year of W-2s. Uh, again, we help a lot of people with this form, uh, but it's something that you would, that's the first step in trying to get financial aid for college. And then again, what is financial aid? I threw that term out there, but what is that? Financial aid is basically just money to help you pay for college. Financial refers to money. Aid means to help, money to help pay for college. There's two different types of financial aid. There's the gift aid. That would be your scholarships and grants. Those you do not have to pay back. They're just money to use. That's why it's a gift called gift aid. And then there's the self-help aid. That would be loans, which students do have to pay back. And most of the time there's going to be interest involved in those. And then there's a program called work study where the student might um, be offered the chance to have a job on campus or around campus somewhere to make a certain amount of money. Um, and then they can spend that money however they need. They'll be paid periodically and they can use it for whatever they need. And this financial aid, the gift aid, self-help aid, they come from these different sources. Some of it comes from the federal government, some comes from the state government. So that were in our case, that would be Iowa students going to Iowa schools, federal government aid can, come, can be for any student from any state going to any state in college. State aid would be for Iowa students going to Iowa colleges. Institutional aid, which would be money that comes usually as scholarships or grants from the colleges and universities themselves, and then private sources. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The reality of financial aid is that most families are not saving enough money for their students to attend college. Sometimes they think financial aid is going to cover all of it, which it does not. Um, again, financial aid is money meant to help pay for college. And if, if you're lucky, maybe um, the scholarships and grants will cover maybe about a third of the cost. There are students where it covers more than that. There are students where it covers less than that. But typically, it doesn't cover everything. So it's important to have conversations, students and parents together, about whatever they think they might be doing for training after high school. Talk about what kind of um, plan you have. Can the parents help? Will the parents help? Will it all be on the student? Can the student start working and saving up some money now? Um, just whatever the plan is, have conversations with your student. And so there's no surprise when all of a sudden spring of that senior year, they're wanting to pick a certain school and, and they thought parents were maybe going to help and parents aren't going to be able to. So have those conversations and, and create a plan. Most of the time nowadays, students do end up having to borrow money, especially if they're looking at a four-year degree or beyond, so a bachelor's degree or beyond. It's very difficult for most families probably um, to to have the student graduate debt-free if they're looking, especially if they're looking at a bachelor's degree or beyond. But the main thing um, about that is that it's not horrible to have some student debt. It, it can be very necessary to make goals happen. But it's important to think how much the student might have to borrow for that whole program. So for a bachelor's degree, how much are they gonna have to borrow for the full four years? Or if they're going into some kind of a graduate program, how much are they gonna have to borrow over the full, full five, six or more years? And in that research in the career exploration, again, I mentioned this earlier, it's important to check out salaries, starting salaries, especially in this case, because you don't want the student to borrow more in their entire program than they would actually make that first year of work with their starting salary. It would be very easy, very easy to chalk up 60, 70, $80,000 in debt, even going maybe to just a state university in Iowa, in state. But what happens is, um, these are approximate, but if, you, if a student borrows $80,000 for their degree, they're likely looking at around $800 a month paying that back when they go into the, the world of work. And that's gonna be a hefty, hefty fee for a student for most people in their first year of, of career. So again, do some research, find out what starting salaries might be, and then figure, depending on what colleges you're looking at, figure how much debt, how much loan is going to probably accumulate throughout that entire program and try to pick a school where that total debt 
will not exceed what that starting salary would be. And then students will be okay paying that back. If you haven't started saving for college yet, it's never too late. Um, start a savings account, start putting away money little by little. Have the, the student can work a little, maybe some extra hours in the summer, maybe a little part-time job throughout the year on a weekend. Put away some of that. Um, if, this, if the parents wanted to start some kind of a educational savings plan, 529 or something like that, again, never too late to do that. And every bit that you can save up to put on that bill will be less money the student has to borrow in the end. Private sources are a great way to um, continue to help pay for college, especially when there's a little bit more involved in the cost than maybe you expected. The best source for private scholarships will be your school counselor. They get tons of information about local scholarship, about state scholarships, national scholarships, maybe regional scholarships, and they have a way they put that out there each year, and mostly that's for seniors, but you can always start paying attention to it younger than that and seeing if there is anything for underclassmen, or at least make note of scholarships that seem to be available every year and whether or not your, your particular student in your family might qualify for that scholarship. So you can do some of the organization scouting out of scholarships early, even though most of them probably won't come up until your senior year. So check with your school counselor, find out what possible private scholarship opportunities he or she um, knows about that come through their office. Check with employers, parent employers, student employers. Sometimes they have scholarships you may not realize they have. Professional and religious organizations, sometimes those organizations, if you belong to them, have scholarships. Um, businesses, I've seen scholarships from internet companies, um, cell phone companies, um, insurance companies, just everywhere you go, keep your eyes and ears open and don't be afraid to ask if there's any kind of a scholarship available from your membership or your subscription to that service. We have information on our website about the scholarship process. We do web webinars specifically about the scholarship process. We have a database of scholarships on our website as well. Um, so lots of opportunities out there, but it takes time, effort, organization, and persistence to get these private scholarships. Again, you want to make sure you know about every scholarship, the colleges you're looking at. Um, you want to know about every scholarship they might have for you. Some might be automatic. Some might take some kind of application. But just make sure any of the colleges to which the student's applying, you find out what institutional scholarships they have and if you need to do a separate application for those. Um, next couple of slides are just a couple of examples of private scholarships. This one is um, from Iowa Farm Bureau. So members of Iowa Farm Bureau, you can, if you're not a member, you can become a member, but this is um, a scholarship only open to students of members. And it's open every year, usually the deadline's late in February. With most scholarships, there's some kind of criteria besides the membership of this, it also has criteria. Um, but the student would, if they fit the criteria, your members, you would apply. It's a great program. So if you happen to be Iowa Farm Bureau members or are thinking about joining, keep that in mind because they do that every year. This is one open to pretty much all high school seniors in Iowa. It's the Iowa Financial Know-How Challenge. It's supported by or done by Iowa Student Loan. They're a huge partner of ours and they also do private educational loan lending. Um, they give out $32,000 scholarships to Iowa high school seniors, usually runs from October to February. They go to the website, listen to some tutorials, take some assessment over the tutorials all about financial literacy. And then the 30, 30 highest scores receive a scholarship. And then the recipient's school also receives $100. So that's a neat program. Um, not everybody takes the time to do that. So watch for that to come out. Take a screenshot of that. And when you're senior, take advantage of that. There are a lot of websites and apps out there. These are legitimate sites. They're also listed in our booklet that I talked about earlier, our college career planning booklet. We also have them on our website, I'm pretty sure. Um, they're legitimate too, but start with your private scholarships that you hear about from your counselor, your employer, your church, all those kinds of things. Start with those first, your memberships. And then if you want some supplemental things to apply for, certainly check out these different websites. And again, we do have a database of scholarships on our iCanSucceed.org website as well. This is a micro scholarship program called raise.me. Students can register at raise.me, um, create an account, and then they can register anytime starting in ninth grade. And they actually build up points, um, which is basically money uh, that they can use for college at participating colleges and universities. And we have the Iowa colleges and universities listed that do currently participate in raise.me, but they get points, money, 
um, for certain activities they do, certain courses they take, events they attend, and it just accumulates over those four years. It's not too late to join um, the Raise.me program your senior year, but if you start earlier, you may be able to accumulate some more money, some more points for money. So check that out. Another helpful item for students would be to create some kind of an activities resume, basically an organized document of the students' um, school information, academic information, activity information, leadership positions, honors and awards, employment, community service, volunteering, um, all those types of things organized onto one document. Sometimes those can be used as attachments to a scholarship application, or even if the student has to fill out a specific page of an application on their own without attachment, this can be used to actually remember all of the things the student has done and accomplished. So if you haven't started one of these, I would say start it early. The earlier you start it in high school, the better and easier it's going to be to complete it and have it be accurate. It can also be used for um, people writing letters of recommendation for scholarships as well. So we have a template for this on our website as well, if you would like to use our template. And then finally, how can parents help? Well, if you're a parent and you're listening to this at any point, you're already helping because you're trying to find out information. So that's wonderful. Also, just lay out your expectations early. Um, talk about these things early. I kind of mentioned that with, when it came to financial information earlier in the webinar. But have expectations for grades and the kinds of courses the student takes. Encourage them to challenge themselves. You know, a little bit lower grade in a challenging course is really going to mean more to the student down the road than a really great grade in a very easy course. So challenge, have the students, encourage the students to challenge themselves, um, make clear your expectations about courses and academics. Um, if there have to be consequences, do it, I guess. Um, financially, again, who's going to pay the bills? Where's that money going to come from? Will the student have an allowance when they're at school or will they be completely on their own? Um, will there be a credit card sent to campus? And if so, how's that going to be used? Is there going to be a car going to campus? If so, who's responsible for the insurance? Who's responsible for the parking costs? Who's responsible for paying for gas? Um, just everything that has to do with those areas. Have conversations early and then there are no surprises when the time comes for the student to be about ready to go to college. And then finally, this comes from me as a parent and as a former school counselor and teacher, I would say, but parents, if you're listening, help your students become more independent. Each year of high school, help them be able to um, stand up for themselves, help them be able to ask questions, ask for help when needed. Um, sometimes students are going to be disappointed. We've all had heartache and disappointments in our lives and you know, they need support from us as adults, but sometimes they have to face the consequences themselves or go ask for help themselves or go try to resolve a conflict themselves. And the more we can help them do those things for themselves, as well as learn skills like managing their own money and budgeting and doing their laundry and being able to make meals or grocery shop, all those different things that we help our students learn throughout high school, help them be more independent in college. And I can tell you from experience, they help as a parent in letting them go off to college and knowing that we helped them become independent young adults before they actually stepped out of our homes. So just, just help them with everything you can and be as supportive as you can. There are lots of places for help. Your school counselor is a wonderful resource for all of, all of these kinds of things, college planning, career exploration. Um, they have a wealth of knowledge and if they don't know the answer, they know lots of people, they have lots of contacts that they can send you to. Your college admissions and financial aid office people, they are experts about their schools. So do reach out to them and don't be afraid to ask them questions. That's what they're there for. There's not there's never any kind of a dumb question, remember. So anything you need to know, don't be afraid to ask. And then also know that ICANN is here for you. Again, we have offices all over the state. We have virtual appointments. We have phone call answers that we can give you. So don't be afraid to call us. Use our website, ICANNSucceed.org for information and know that our services are provided for free. Lastly, this is a picture of our homepage of our website. You can see we have all kinds of different tabs across the top information relating to career planning, college planning, financial aid. Um, you can schedule your own appointment from our website if you don't want to call. You can click where we have events and presentations and see what kinds of events might be coming up in your area or what kinds of um, webinars might be uh, coming up 
on certain dates. Um, we have some quick links listed. This is our website, icansucceed.org. So um, just know this website is here for you and we're here for you and, and ready to help in any way we can. So that's all I have. Um, again, whether you were listening live today or whether you're listening to or watching a recording later, I wanna thank you for joining me. And I wish you the best in your college and career planning and exploration adventures. And parents, um, just hang in there and support your children in this process. And students, um, do take the time to do your, your homework, do your exploration of your colleges and your career exploration. And it will really help you as you begin to prepare to graduate from high school and go on to the next step. So thank you again for listening and watching. Take care. Bye-bye.